From the doctor who gets bitten by thousands of mosquitoes to the one who gets an ear implanted on his arm to the praying mantis dressed in Prada. Sit back and relax. Today we're going to show you 10 strange experiments performed by scientists. Stellark is an Australian artist known for his body art experiments, in which he mixes the biological body with electronic components, supporting the thesis that the human body is perfectible and that without technological tools, it remains obsolete. Realizing that he was followed by thousands of internet users, Stellark had a revolutionary idea, that of having an ear grafted into his arm so that all these people could follow his movements to the second. Thus, he had recourse to surgery to have a biopolymer structure inserted in his arm, relying also on cell culture, so that the organ is grafted correctly. Better still, Stellark plans to make his third ear interactive and to equip it with a connected microphone and GPS, and to connect it permanently to the internet so that his users can follow it. I don't know what gave him the idea, but his idea is absolutely unusual. Today, the director of the Alternative Anatomy Laboratory at Curtin University has already created an exoskeleton, inserted a sculpture in his stomach, and used a third robotic arm to write. At this point, he must certainly feel a bit broken down and wobbly at times, but what matters to him is advancing science. And even if he sacrifices his body and modifies it as he sees fit, his determination remains unshakable. NASA is at the origin of several extraordinary scientific experiments that have revolutionized humanity. In the late 1980s, researchers embarked on a program that was as ambitious as it was surreal, that of creating a closed artificial ecological system and living in it for two whole years. The researchers saw this experiment as an archetype for a viable ecosystem that could be replicated somewhere in the universe. Thus, the largest closed ecological system in the world was created in the middle of the desert, near the Santa Catalina Mountains. This very special experiment was named Biosphere 2, considering that our planet is Biosphere 1. Under the dome of the gigantic structure were placed, plants, animals, and eight people who had to live for two years in several hectares of greenhouse, cut off from the rest of the world by a wall of 14 millimeters of tempered glass and an underground cover of several hundred square meters. The biosphere housed several reconstructions of the ecosystem, a tropical forest, an ocean with its coral reef, a mangrove, a desert, a savanna, a swamp, entire hectares reserved for agriculture, animals, neighborhoods, housing, and everything vital and necessary for survival. The atmosphere having to remain impenetrable throughout the experiment, the scientists who volunteered for the mission had to ensure their food autonomy by cultivating their own food thanks to the plantations. The researchers aimed to study each climatic or biological change affecting the different biomes reproduced in the biosphere. But as time went on, the inhabitants of the sphere noticed that the oxygen was gradually decreasing. This caused the animals to suffer to the point that some died. As a result, the scientists in turn began to suffer from the lack of oxygen and many became ill. Added to all this was an uncontrollable proliferation of cockroach colonies and other pests that they had to contain. Eventually, the project was aborted due to the problem of air recycling. The people who lived inside also suffered from hunger, thirst, lack of oxygen, and the tensions that this generated did not help. As if this was not enough, NASA was criticized for the uselessness of such an experiment and especially for the staggering cost of $200 million that the project required. Today, these scientists may have come out empty-handed and washed out of such an experiment, but they at least have the merit of having proved to the scientific community that recreating and controlling an autonomous ecosystem on Earth was a challenge that was completely beyond them. While researchers from the University of Bath were quietly urinating in the toilets of the institution, they had an idea that was, to say the least, brilliant. Urinating can sometimes last a long time, long enough apparently for these researchers to decide to invent a microbial fuel cell, which transforms urine into electricity. Yes, the best inventions are obviously born at the bottom of a toilet bowl. To carry out their project, the researchers had to collect liters of urine and bring them to the laboratory. Their plan was to use the natural biological processes of electric bacteria to transform organic matter into energy. According to them, a single 6 square centimeters battery would be able to generate 2 watts per cubic meter, enough energy to recharge a cell phone. And since an adult produces an average of 2 liters of urine per day or about 40,000 liters in a lifetime, there is no shortage of raw material. They so nicely named their technique, the P-Power. What a class! Well, to achieve a palpable and above all lasting result, they will certainly have to urinate several hundred times a day. In the worst case, if this technique is not successful, they will have enough to recharge their own smartphones for free.
Wanting to know what happens after death is indeed the fantasy of many humans, but from there to want to bring the dead back to life, one must be either audacious or unbalanced. This is exactly what happened to Giovanni Aldini, who for a long time was fascinated by the case of the murderer George Forster. The latter had been sentenced to death for having killed his wife and child. The Italian physicist then fixed an idea in his head, bring the murderer back to life. And for this, he did not hesitate to show his experiments to the general public. Thus, the physicist placed electrodes on several places of the dead man's body to make electricity circulate, a technique commonly called galvanism. This technique consists of contracting the muscles of the body with the help of electric discharges. Giovanni Aldini then discovered that some of Forster's muscles started to move and that he even opened an eye. But the experiment was such a fiasco that no one wanted to repeat it. Giovanni finally abandoned the idea after realizing that Forster had not been brought back to life. It is said that Giovanni then turned to paint on canvas, more jovial and down-to-earth indeed. Pigeons are certainly intelligent animals, and for a long time, they have served humans as messengers. Well, it seems that this wasn't enough for these Chinese scientists from the Robotics and Engineering Research Center of Shandong University of Science and Technology, who hope to get much more out of these poor little beasts. They want to create remote-controlled pigeons. Yes, real ones, and remote-controlled ones at that. In concrete terms, they have implanted microelectrodes in the brains of the pigeons, which allow them to stimulate several parts of the brain to control them. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? In 2007, they succeeded in developing the first remote-controlled pigeon. A poor animal that wisely responds to the instructions given by computer, that glides, turns, goes from left to right, according to the wishes of scientists. In short, with a single click, they manage to direct and control all the directional movements of the bird as if it were a robot. Amazing! The problem in the story is that these so-called researchers have crushed their neurons to be able to control those of a small harmless bird, and for what purpose? Well, they are unable to tell you the purpose of this so ambitious project. Still, today they have turned to mice. We can only pray that they stop there and do not move on to humans. A small step for man, some would say, but what about the dignity and respect of the animals involved? While studying the life of insects and praying mantises, in particular, researchers from the University of Newcastle had the idea to submit them to an unusual experiment, bordering on the unreasonable. Indeed, to study the stereoscopic vision of these complex insects, and then to be able to use the results for further purposes, these researchers dressed the praying mantises with tiny 3D glasses. This experiment would, according to them, simplify the algorithms regulating perception in robots. To do this, the researchers glued two tiny fragments of 3D glasses to the insect's eyes using beeswax. The mantises were then placed in a small insect cinema, in which a video of prey was projected, giving the illusion of standing in front of the praying mantis, as in a normal 3D projection, for humans more precisely. The insects, believing that it was a real prey, fell into the trap and tried to catch it with their paws. The experiment allowed them to realize that the perception of these insects was very different from that of humans. They found that praying mantises do not care about the details of an image but only look at what is in motion, while humans are more efficient on still images. It must not have been easy for them to dress a whole army of praying mantises in tiny 3D glasses, and especially to convince them to sit still during the movie session. But at least they were able to come out of this experiment with the hope that one day, the stereoscopic vision of such a small insect could be applied to robots such as drones. At the end of the 18th century, coffee was still a relatively unknown drink. It had only just entered Europe. People were drinking it, but no one knew exactly what its benefits or side effects were. King Gustav of Sweden was particularly intrigued and wanted to try a crazy experiment to find out more about the effects of this new beverage from the other side of the world. So he naturally thought of two twins condemned to death to play the role of guinea pigs. He then proposed a deal, save them from being hanged in exchange for life imprisonment, provided that they ingest the equivalent of three large pots of coffee for one and tea for the other. This is how the scientists proceeded to satisfy the curiosity of their king. The only problem with this relatively simple experiment is that the study lasted so long that the scientists who were monitoring the study died before the prisoners, and King Gustav must surely have abstained for a long time before drinking good coffee for fear of hurting himself. In the end, it was the tea-drinking prisoner who died first. Our friend Gustav III was thus able to take coffee for his breakfasts, but not for very long. Indeed, the ingenious ruler was murdered by one of his soldiers. 
If he had known, I am sure he would have preferred to die of a coffee overdose. Donating one's body to science is a very commendable act, which some people wish to perform after their death. The man we are going to see today wished to do the same, with one detail. Paran Stott Rossist is a research entomologist who has been working for several years at the University of Melbourne, Australia. In Australia, as in many parts of the world, there are several species of mosquitoes, which act as vectors of diseases and viruses. So, Paran decided to offer his arm to science, to perform several tests, we don't know which fly bit him. Well, it's not exactly a fly, the researcher has decided to let himself be bitten every day by a horde of mosquitoes to advance his research and finally find a way to fight against the dengue virus and thus stop its spread. To do this, he slips his arm inside a huge box that houses about 5,000 infected little bloodsuckers. The objective of this experiment is to transmit Wolbachia, a bacterium that slows down the transmission of dengue. This bacterium will then be transmitted from generation to generation, which will lead to a total blockage of the transmission of the disease. Needless to say, every day the doctor loses about 16 milliliters of blood and leaves the university with a swollen and very irritated arm. As far as we know, the study has not yet revealed any results, but what is certain is that Dr. Paran is not ready to give up. On the contrary, he is much more motivated than on the first day. So what do you think of these unusual experiences? Tell us in the comments which one you find the strangest. And if you like this video, don't forget to give us a like, subscribe to the channel, and activate the bell to receive all the notifications and not miss anything of our next content.